Good afternoon. I'm Mitchell Kaplan, founder of Books and Books. And on behalf of all of us here at Books and Books and our partners at Writers for Democratic Action, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this very, very important and very timely event. You know, the Brennan Center reports that as of March, there were 361 bills with restrictive voter provisions introduced across 47 states. Today, that number has now grown to over 400. Just a few days ago, in fact, Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis shamefully signed one of the most draconian set of suppression laws, which was overwhelmingly passed by our state legislature. His, his motives in this blatant effort to restrict voting was made even more apparent by his decision to sign the law on an appearance on Fox News. The signing, in fact, was closed to all other media outlets. Texas, I believe, yesterday passed yet another voter suppression law, following the state's long tradition of trying to preserve the, quote, purity of the ballot box. Preserving the purity of the ballot box. Imagine such a thing. This very same language, was, which was added to the Texas Constitution following the Civil War to disenfranchise black, voter, black voters, giving rise to all white primaries, was initially included in their bill. Ohio, also reported yesterday, is as well on a fast track to pass these very same kinds of laws. It's imperative that none of us become complacent. And to that end, it's my honor and the honor of Books and Books to be co-hosting this conversation with Alexander Kesar and Paul Auster. Congressman Jamie Raskin describes Alexander as, quote, our great narrator of the American right to vote and a national treasure who keeps giving us the history we need right when we need it. He's the author of Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College, published by Harvard University Press in 2020, and The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States. Although published in 2000, it's as relevant now as ever. He's the Matthew W. Sterling Jr. Professor of History and Social Policy at Harvard University, and he specializes in the exploration of historical problems that have contemporary policy implications. And before introducing Paul, I wanna say something about Writers for Democratic Action, our partner in today's event. In the creative process, James Baldwin writes, a society must assume that it is stable, but the artist must know and he must let us know that there is nothing stable under heaven. In 2020, a small but fierce group of writers founded the organization Writers Against Trump, which grew to over 2,000 members. And after the 2020 election victory, it became Writers for Democratic Action, an expanding international alliance of writers, bookstores, and literary organizations, WDA, brings together the literary community to promote and protect democracy, demand racial and economic justice, champion suffrage, and resist white supremacist and fascist movements. WDA's mission statement reads, in fact, we stand vigilant in the service of the Republic to serve the common good. One of these fierce founders is the great Paul Auster. I first encountered Paul's work as a young bookseller, eagle, eagerly working my way through the New York trilogy. From there, I devoured everything he wrote, 4321, The Book of Illusions, Winter Journal, Sunset Park, Invisible, just to name a few. His translations of French poetry and his filmmaking and collaborations with artists have brought all of us great joy. His highly anticipated new biography of Stephen Crane will be published by Henry Halt in the fall. 
And while he's been honored more times than one can imagine from countries all over the world, and his work has been translated into more than 40 languages, I'm most impressed, because I love them too, by his love for the typewriter, and that he still bangs out his work on a well-worn manual Smith Corona. He lives in Brooklyn with his equally wonderful wife, the writer Siri Hustved, another one of those fierce founders of WDA. Before I bring them on, I just want to say a couple of things for you, the audience, and to take note of them. We'll be taking questions, and if you have one and like to ask one, just click the appropriate button that you see on your screen. And of course, if you'd like to purchase a book by either of our speakers, there is a button that will bring you, it brings you first to a list of Paul's books, uh, uh, I mean, Alex's books, Alex's, Alex Kesar's books. And then all you have to do is put Paul's name into the search engine and you'll find every one of Paul's books too. So now, without further delay, I'd like to welcome Alexander Kesar and Paul Oster to the virtual stage. Uh, Mitch, thank you so much for that extraordinary introduction um, for both of us. Um, Okay, I'm going to give my own introduction now. And um, the question before us today is voting rights in America. But in fact, the question concerns the present state of our democracy and to what extent the future of the republic is in peril. Or to put it another way, to what extent has the United States ever been a true democracy? And what hope do we have of creating a just and fair society for all our citizens? These questions are especially urgent just now, only months after the most disturbing presidential election in our history, an election in which one candidate amassed seven million more popular votes than his opponent, and yet won the electoral college vote through a number of razor thin victories in swing states that still hung in the balance days after the voting ended. Beyond that, and even worse than that, the defeated candidate refused to accept his defeat and instead claimed, without, with, with not one fact or legitimate argument to support that claim, that the election had been stolen from him, a lie that was believed and continues to be believed by tens of millions of his followers. Within two months of the election, all hell broke loose when a horde of these deluded followers stormed the Capitol building, bent on overturning the Electoral College vote. To accomplish that goal, Many of them were prepared to lynch the vice president and murder as many Democratic senators and members of the House as possible. These things happened just four months ago, but the nightmare is still vivid to all of us. And in the short time, the new administration has been in office. Republican-controlled state legislatures across the country have passed or are on the brink of passing hundreds of bills to clamp down on and restrict voting accessibility in their jurisdictions. That is why Writers for Democratic Action has organized today's discussion with our foremost scholar on the history of American voting rights, a straight person-to-person -person dialogue rather than one of our usual panel discussions, during which Alex Kesar and I will touch on these recent and current events and also look into such matters as gerrymandering, the electoral college system, the filibuster, the role played by the census in the distribution of political power, and the new voting rights bills that have already been passed by the House of Representatives and will soon be coming before the Senate. I also want to say how delighted I, ha I am to be here with Professor Kesar today, not just because he is the best person to talk about these issues with, but because Alex and I go way back together, all the way back to when we were 15 years old and just starting high school, where we were close friends until the day we graduated and then blundered out into the big wide world beyond our small New Jersey town. The brilliant friend of my youth has turned into the brilliant scholar he was always destined to become. And how happy I am to see you today, Alex, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Paul, for that generous 
and warm introduction. It's very much appreciated. And I'm also, you know, there's a, there's a particular delight in being able to have this conversation with you, um, you know, at this event. I also want to take this, this opening um, moment to thank Books and Books and Writers for Democratic Action for sponsoring this event, putting it together, and um, and working with Paul and then with me to uh, to gather us here today. I mean, I think that this this work, the work that 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 Books and Books and Writers for Democratic Action are doing is extremely important, um, and uh, it's important work for all of us. But so. Thank you, and I'm 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 really glad, and it's really good to see you, Paul. We, we thank you, thank even you. though our our hair is lighter in color than it, than it was, and less of it too. Uh, right. But nevertheless, uh, we're still boys at heart, Alex. <laughs> Struggling boys at heart. All right, I'm going to plunge in with the first question, which, as I warned you, is the longest one. Um, in 2000, George W. Bush won the presidency, even though he lost the popular vote to Al Gore. In 2016, Donald Trump won the presidency, even though he lost to Hillary Clinton by nearly 3 million popular votes. A few days after Trump's win, I was interviewed by British TV journalist Jon Snow on Channel 4 to offer my comments. And what I said was more or less this. Since the Civil War, most Americans have tended to believe in the solidity of our institutions, a society governed by the rule of law, free and fair elections, and the peaceful transition of power once those elections have been decided, rock-solid institutions that we look upon proudly as if they were granite buildings. But what if, I said, those buildings were in fact made of soap? And what if the new administration comes in and turns its hoses on those soap buildings? What then? They will begin to melt. And our once fine granite buildings will be turned into suds, running through the gutters of the streets as the buildings themselves grow smaller and smaller. And that is precisely what happened over the next four years as the supposedly incompetent Trump administration systematically went about its business of dismantling the American government, creating an environmental protection agency that did not believe in protecting the environment, a Department of Education that did not believe in public schools, a Justice Department that did not believe in civil rights, and a State Department that was so eviscerated that we failed to send ambassadors to more than 30 countries. All this from an administration that was not elected by a majority of the people, but was put in office because of one of the more bizarre quirks embedded in our constitution, the electoral college, which brings me to my first question. Your most recent book is entitled, Why Do We Still Have the Electoral College? I'm curious to know if you think we can ever figure out a way to scrap that old war horse, or are we doomed to be saddled with it forever? It's a it's a very good and very important question. Um, I I don't think we're doomed to be settled with it forever. Although, um, you know, having just written published a book about two hundred years of failed attempts to, uh, to to change it, I can't suddenly turn on a dime and say, well, you know, follow me. It's going to be easy. Um, the the uh, the you know one thing to say for those who have not worked through that book but who are busy ordering it as we speak um, <laughs> uh, is that we uh, there have been a great many attempts to seriously reform or abolish the electoral college i mean there have been there have been more constitutional amendments introduced on that subject than on any other and on several occasions we have come very close uh, one of which was in our lifetimes at least at least for us um if not younger members of the audience it was 1969-70 the house of representatives voted by an 83 percent vote uh to abolish the electoral college and replace it with the national popular vote and um it had strong majority support in the senate the story is complicated but it was killed by a, a filibuster led by Southern senators. So I, I guess it, I mentioned these examples to, to say that it's not something which has always been off the table or off the agenda. 
for the last 40 years since 1980, it has, a, I mean, it has in effect been off the agenda of Congress, and we really do need a constitutional amendment to change it, and to, for that we do need Congress. It's been off the agenda of Congress because the Republican Party decided uh, in the 1980s that the Electoral College advantages its candidates, and they don't want to change it. They don't have a, to be honest with you, they don't have a principled reason for defending it. It's just, it's pure partisan advantage. The glimmer of hope at the end of this long paragraph is that uh, the two occasions when we have come closest to getting rid of the Electoral College, uh, the 1969 episode and another one in the, another sort of 10-year period in the 19th century, were both periods when the party system was in flux, when the part, there was some reconfiguration of the parties going on. Um, and that created openings since the, the partisan world wasn't simply dichotomous, that created openings uh, for progress. I also have to say here that the Republicans in the late 1960s and early 1970s favored abolition of the Electoral College. Many, many Republicans did. Um, but I, th I think that, we, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to the Republican Party over the next few years. Uh, I certainly don't have any inside, I insight into that. But I think that a period of instability in the... Um, in the party system might create some openings and a majority of the American people, a strong majority of the American people has wanted to replace the electoral college with a national popular vote as long as we have had public opinion polls, which is now about 80 years. Well, just to follow up with this, uh, could you give me your opinion of uh, the NPVIC, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact? which was introduced in 2006. Does it still have a chance, do you think? And But maybe you should explain what this is first. I was just rereading your book yesterday on this particular subject, and it's very thorough examination of the pros and cons, but I think everyone should know what this thing is. Right, right. It's important because it, 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 it has garnered the most attention. The, the NPVIC um, was launched really out of frustration with Congress, I mean, with a desire to get rid of the Electoral College or, or have a national popular vote, um, and uh, frustration with the dismal prospects of a constitutional amendment in Congress. That you know that. So this is an attempt to go around Congress. Uh, what it is is a interstate compact. States join the compact. For example, my state in Massachusetts has joined uh, the compact. And by joining the compact, it says that it that when the compact takes effect, and I'll get to that in a second, but that when the compact takes effect, um, Massachusetts will cast its electoral votes, all of its electoral votes, for whoever won the national popular vote, not the vote in Massachusetts. The compact takes effect when... Uh, states with 270 electoral votes, i.e. a majority, have signed on to the compact. So the theory is that, you know, at that point, then all states would have signed on to say we'll vote for the national popular vote winner and whoever wins the national popular vote will become president. That's, that, that is the mechanism. It had, it, it, it had built a fair amount of support, uh, less so in, in, in very recent years, I think there are 15 states in D.C. that have signed on to it with 195 electoral votes. It's been it's been a very successful organizing effort, and I have to say that I you know I I, I was very supportive of this uh, at the outset and for a number of years. I think I'm you know somewhere somewhere there's a list of people endorsing this and it has my name. Um, I. Uh, I have real concerns about it. I, I think that the NPVIC has been a very good path to mobilize support, but I don't think that the institution it proposes is uh, is the solution. And just I'll say very briefly why this is in addition to the fact that you know it, if it ever came into being, the lawsuits over it would go on uh, for the rest of our lifetimes, and that's almost not a joke. Um, but I think that the problem with the compact is that it's unstable. Um, and, you know, suppose we, we, enough states signed on to the compact and suppose it was used 
during one election. Um, but then a, a couple of states decided, you know, p- people in states, my state said, well, no, we don't want to cast our, our, our electoral votes for the Republican winner of the national popular vote. Um, so we're going to withdraw from the compact. So then in the next election, you'd be back to run, having the election run by, 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 old, by the other rules, by the old rules. And I think that kind of instability um, is a bad thing in itself, and it creates more opportunities for parties to game the system. And we need fewer opportunities of that sort, not more. Well, I, I reluctantly agree with you, and I, I had thought of it as a very positive step. But after the experience of J- January 6th also, it doesn't look as good as it did before. And you cite in your book the example of Utah, which, uh, in and I guess it was 2016, um, voted only 27% for Hillary Clinton. And if they had signed the compact, that would have meant, um, you know, going against uh, more than 70% of their of their population, the people who voted. So it, it is it does have flaws um, in spite of its early promise. Um, so as you say, we're going to need a constitutional amendment, and that's a very hard thing to get through. All right, moving on. Um, the Electoral College is just one of several features of our government that undermines the principles of democracy. The United States Senate is another. The fact that each state sends two senators to Washington no matter what the size of its population, meaning that Wyoming, with approximately 500,000 people, has the same number of senators as California, which has approximately 40 million people, giving each Wyoming vote 80 times more power than a California vote. The end result is de facto minority rule. And all this was cooked into the Constitution by the framers, who on top of that, notoriously allowed the southern states to add to their populations and therefore increase the size of their representation in Congress by counting each slave as three-fifths of a person, while at the same time, of course, denying slaves the right to vote. Nor did things improve after the abolition of slavery, with black people now counted as five-fifths of a person, that is a whole person, at least as far as the census was concerned, but still denied the right to vote in a world ruled by Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws. The South only increased its power in Congress and successfully blocked passage of any meaningful civil rights legislation for close to 90 years. In a country that calls itself a democratic republic, a minority has always called the shots and still does. Dear Alex, is there anything we can do about this? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're starting with the small, sort of very concrete and easy <laughs> questions. Uh, 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 <clears throat> it's, I mean, the you know, I, I have no dispute with your historical portrait. Um, and it's, um, it's 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 a pre, it's a pretty grim one. Although I th- I think l- l- let me complicate the uh, the trajectory a little bit um, in a way that might offer s- uh, you know some chances for uh, insight or hope. Um, certainly, you know, at the nation's founding, um, I mean, you know, the word the, the word democratic was a was kind of an epithet. Um, you know, it was what you, it was called that person. Uh, you know, it's. It's like the the politicians that Rick Santorum calls socialists, right? I mean, it was you know the, this was this was an unfavorable term that changes after about thirty or forty years, um, but you know the compromises in the Constitution. Uh, there are compromises built into the U.S. Constitution that were necessary in order to form a U.S. Constitution in order to form a country. Uh, the Senate is part of a compromise between the big states and the small states, and the rightly notorious three-fifths clause was a compromise between the the slave states and the free states. Um, And those compromises vested power in in minorities. Whoops, let me unplug my landline. I haven't gotten a call on my landline since, uh, you know, 2017, but now, now of course, it rings. Um, The... uh, 
the longer trajectory or, or for uh, for many years the trajectory of our history with many ups and downs and the ups and downs are important the reverses are important but for the moment actually has been towards greater inclusion um you know you can tell a story as a celebratory story that well it's become less of a uh, of a minority ruling you know the enfranchisement of women uh, earlier in the 20th century doubled the size of the electorate the removal of property requirements before the civil war greatly increased the size of the electorate and moved us more towards um a uh a majoritarian system and then obviously the complex issues with race and then uh, ethnic and, and language minorities have also been an up and down struggle what i think is really notable about our the period that we live in now is that if you look back at the rhetoric and the politics of the 1960s and the 1970s even into the early 1980s you would think that after the passage of the Voting Rights Act and the various things that were done, that that the issue had finally been settled. Okay, we accept, you know, the country accepts democracy. We'll we'll work within these rules. Um, you know, it really did look like, uh, uh, you know, th that there was a consensus, and that consensus has now unraveled. It hasn't unraveled rhetorically. I mean, most Republicans are not saying. Um, we don't think black people should vote, or we, or, or we don't think poor people should vote. Um, but it ha it has uh, really unraveled. So we are in a downswing. Let me make one other comment there about about the trajectory of democracy and of voting rights. Um, the one there's an er there is one earlier period of downswing of of, re of pulling back from democracy and attacks on democracy. And it's the period of the late 19th and early 20th century, for after the Civil War, from about the mid 1870s into the early 20th century. Um, and it looks a lot, in many ways, uh, like like our period. I mean, that is the period of you know of Jim Crow laws, of the disenfranchisement of blacks who were supposedly enfranchised by the 15th Amendment, and by a number of draconian voting obstacles passed in northern states uh include you know including uh well th throughout the mid-atlantic states including massachusetts um that period and the current period have something important in common which is that it the late 19th century era was an era when briefly african americans were empowered in the south you know it's a part of our history we you know we have to remember uh, during Reconstruction and depending on the state for another 5, 10, even 15 years, um, African Americans wielded some significant political power um, in the South. In Northern states, this is a period of very, very high rates of immigration. The attacks on democracy were national ones, angry, I think, precipitated by both of those groups. Um, and I think that we see real parallels today. If you look at the last 30 or 40 years, one of the characteristics is that African Americans have some political power in the United States. You know, uh, Barack Obama's election doesn't mean that there was no racism in the United States, but it was an important, an important moment. And there are many, many African American local officials uh, who, who have held office. And we have very, very high rates of immigration. And I think that uh, that is po has posed a threat that conservative forces are now acting on. It was also a period, uh, we're talking about um, the Gilded Age, um, which was economically uh, a precursor to what we're living through now, um, an age of the, uh, the much money in the hands of the few and almost no money in the hands of the many. Um, I would also say, um, I, it seems to me that Obama's election in 2008, which I celebrated as, at the time, as maybe one of the greatest things we'd ever done as a country. Uh, it was so encouraging. It, it made everyone who voted for him and believed in in that cause uh, so so happy. And and then I don't think we fully understood the depth of the reaction that would be set off by that election. Uh, but in no time flat, the Tea Party was forming itself. And in no time flat, the Republican Party 
was reforming itself into something else that has mutated in these past 12 years or so into what we have now, which is a party that is unrecognizable, a party that is not even a, a legitimate party. It's a, it's a party of um, delusion and, and, and lies. And um, it's, I think, again, it gets back to the big question of race in America. And every time we talk about this country, ultimately that's, that's the thing we, we land on again and again and again. All right, another question, because all these things are linked and we're just, I'm just building up to the kinds of questions I want to keep, keep, keep going for. Um, 2020 census results were announced just a few weeks ago. And once again, the apportioning of congressional seats has become a national issue. We all know how fervently the previous administration worked to keep the numbers as low as possible. And when you combine that with the effects of the pandemic and growing fears of deportation among immigrant communities, the numbers were indeed low, shockingly low, which suggests that there has been a serious undercount. But rather than dwell just now on all that and how to ensure accurate census results every 10 years, independent of the whims of any particular administration, I'd just like to pass on to the question of gerrymandering, which always follows on the heels of the latest census. And in your opinion, again, I mean, I know you're not Mr. Fix-It, but uh, it is just, I, I just, I think everyone would like to hear, is there any way to fix this legalized cheating, which has been practiced by both parties over the years, and guarantee just representation for all voters? The new voting rights bill addresses the problem by mandating bipartisan panels to draw the lines of voting districts and take away that power from the state legislatures. Is that the answer or do you see any other way of solving the problem? Very critical issue. I, I, th I, think, I think that district and commissions are the answer. Um, you know, uh, uh, until a couple of years ago, uh, those of us who, who work in this ballpark uh, you know, full time thought that there were two possible answers. One was districting commissions and the other was for the Supreme Court to act against extreme political uh, gerrymandering. Well, the Supreme Court bagged that, you know, threw up its hands and said, nah, not our problem. Um, and so I think we are left with districting commissions and they can work. We have a number of examples uh, where, you know, where they do work. State legislatures will fight against that tooth and nail. I mean, the uh, you know, Arizona had and still has one of the pioneering uh, districting commissions, uh, which includes actually a nonpartisan chair, which is uh, which has been interesting. You know, and the Arizona legislature went into the federal courts to, tr to try to have the districting commission, which had been created by a popular referendum to try to have it declared um, unconstitutional. So there will be fights. But the problem is soluble with nonpartisan districting commissions. I mean, the, the gerrymandering issue is a major route to minority rule. It already is. You know, I, I lived for a number of years in North Carolina. Uh, in North Carolina, in recent elections, the popular vote for members of Congress has been pretty evenly split, you know, within a half a percentage point or not, uh, between the two major parties. Um, and the Republicans are, are getting 80% of the seats. Um, and, you know, and that's that's a model for, uh, you know, a lot of others. And it's it's an egregious practice. And there there is a solution in this case. It will take a lot of political hardball to get it into place, but there is a solution. Okay, well, you see, that leads into my next question. Um, now that we're on the subject, do you have any opinion about HR1 and HR4, now known as S1 and S4? Do you see any flaws in them? And what do you think its chances are of being passed by the Senate? Okay, let me um, let me also do, I, I'll take this occasion to do a little exposition for those in the audience who have not kept up with exactly what HR1 and S1 and, and, and HR4 are. Um, let me start with HR4, which is which is simpler. HR4 is the John Lewis 
uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act, or forget the exact title. Um, and this is this is in effect a an attempt to mend the damage done to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and successive iterations by the Supreme Court when in 2013 it ruled that the uh, the formula about jurisdictions to which the, Vo the Voting Rights Act applied was out of date and thus unconstitutional. And that in effect, that in effect meant that the enforcement, the major enforcement mechanism of the Voting Rights Act was, was, was null and void. That enforcement mechanism, by the way, which was put in by some very savvy people in the 1960s, basically said, um, if you've got a history of, raci of racist practices uh, about voting, any changes you make to the electoral system have to get the approval of the Justice Department or a district court in Washington. And we just say, you know, we're going to keep an eye, we're going to keep a close eye on you and make any changes. Just let us know if they're fine. They're fine, uh, but we, we might raise our objections. And that really served, you know, as a kind of uh, get, a major gatekeeping rule. Anyway, in 2013, it was gone, and the uh, the John Lewis Act is an attempt to uh, to produce a new formula based on contemporary conditions that will meet the Supreme Court's objections. It basically applies to the whole country, not to uh, not to you know just some states, and it applies to different states and and counties, for example, within uh, states based on their recent past practices say over mostly it focuses on the last 10 years so it's a it's a it's a very reasonable approach um to the problem that uh that was presented given you know it's a reasonable approach if you agree that there needs to be some federal oversight over state voting practices, which going back to your introduction and, and, um, and Mitch's introduction, uh, the behavior of many of these states strongly suggests that, that, that there is need for federal oversight. So that's the John Lewis bill. It is actually not even, I think, been passed by the House yet. The House is focused uh, and, not, and it has not been taken up by the Senate. Uh, in a lot of ways, it strikes me as the most coherent uh, as a very coherent and cogent piece of legislation, but whether it can get passed is uh, is unclear. H.R. 1, the For the People Act, um, now S1, has been passed by the House and is waiting action in the Senate. In fact, I think there's a, there's a committee decision of some importance coming up um, next week. It, it's, it's sometimes called an omnibus voting rights act that's... Uh, Omnibus could be translated as grab bag. Um, it's it's got many many different features, some of which deal with uh, with voting procedures and election procedures. It requires, for example, say it, it, the thrust of it is to try to make voting easier. It requires same day registration. Um, it, or, uh, it requires that you have same day registration. It, it sort of uh, requires uh, I think two weeks of early voting. Um, it specifies a number of standards that states have to have to match and have to meet um, uh, in order to conform with the law. And these are standards that, uh, that involve basically making it easier for people to register and vote and making it harder for jurisdictions to toss them off, toss people off the voting rolls. It also has a campaign finance dimension to it, um, uh, which which. Um, in effect, create it's a not very, to my mind, a not very strong campaign finance set of provisions. But um, it puts a maximum limit on uh, some contributions to political parties, and it provides a system of matching that that the government or government fund would match small donations at a ratio of six to one, um, encouraging people to just stick uh, with small donors. Um, it also includes a provision mandating the use of districts uh, of, of, of sorry of commissions of commissions for districting. I think, frankly, that that may be the most powerful uh, provision um, in you know in the whole, in the whole act. Uh, but it, it's so it it covers a lot of ground um, and has many different features. There 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 were 
a lot of the tales of it that secretaries of state and election managers um, found somewhat problematic, but those have now been ironed out. Um, where that is in Congress right now um, is that uh, the Republicans are not going <laughs> to are not going to support this in the Senate. The only chance for getting it through the Senate um, is by suspending or eliminating the filibuster. And whether the Democrats can prevail upon a couple of recalcitrant members to take that step is unclear. Well, that was that was that was where I was leading with my next question into the filibuster. But you've pretty much answered it for me. Um, I mean, because you know, it's just all you need is a majority vote to get rid of it. It's not a constitutional issue; it's a procedural issue. That's right. And um, but every because it's fifty-fifty. Every Democrat would have to vote for it. And as you point out, there are at least one or two, perhaps more, who aren't willing to do that. So if, 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 this, if these bills are defeated, which would be tragic as far as I'm concerned, but I'm, I'm expecting them to be defeated unless the recalcitrant ones can be brought into the fold. Uh, how you do that, um, that's... That's the work of politicians. I don't know how they can, short of, um, well, we won't get into that. Um, uh, uh, so can these new voter suppression laws that are passing right and left all over the country now, and there promise to be many more, can they be challenged in courts? And then I ask myself, what court? Which one? And if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court today, I, I would think, would be almost certain to uphold them, which gives us, on the other side, no recourse. And um, I just want to know if you agree with that or if there is a, a legal way to, to go into the courts and challenge these new laws. Well, there are certainly ways to go into the courts and challenge the laws. I mean, there, there are even some ways in which uh, it can be done in state courts about challenging whether the laws match the provisions of state constitutions. But the major route will be to go into federal courts. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that, I mean, that's already happened. I, you know, I think there are already a bunch of lawsuits against Georgia um, and, and Florida. And, you know, and, and I, I, th I think I heard better work sale at, at last night that, uh, you know, that everybody's prepared to, to start suing Texas as soon as it finishes passing its current draconian law. Um, so then we'll go into the courts and my guess, I mean, I, uh, you know, I haven't looked at the lawsuits and, uh, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not an election lawyer myself, although I sometimes play one on TV. Um, but, um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that they will win some of them, uh, but for the most extreme acts, but that I think that the contest will go to the Supreme Court. And there, I completely share your worry. Um, you know, the surprise moderate, qu quotes moderate, uh, in quotes, um, on the court in recent years has been the Chief Justice, John Roberts. But the one, one issue on which he has showed no signs of moderation it has to do with voting rights. Yes, yes. No, it's true. I do have the feeling, however, dark as the picture is that we're painting of the imminent future, that um, I don't know if Democrats are really going to take this lightly. Uh, my feeling is that uh, in spite of all these hurdles that are be be being put up, everyone can still vote. They're just going to have to stand in line on the day of. And I think uh, tens of millions of people are prepared to do that. So maybe, this is my the hopeful side of my thinking in all this, just maybe these laws are not going to have as much effect as the Republican legislatures think they will, and that people are a lot less stupid than they think they are, and that um, when pushed like this and insulted finally, um, people will stand up and go out and make every effort they can to vote. So we'll see. It's possible. All right. I want... I Going back i just want to go back to the 2020 election just for a second because this is something that is this absolutely tickled me and intrigued me ever since the moment we heard the results 
thinking about the 2020 election again, one of the things that most intrigues me is that Republicans did remarkably well, far better than anyone expected, gaining seats in the House, sweeping state legislatures, and not losing much ground in the Senate. If, as the Stop the Steal crowd insists, the election was bogus, how can they celebrate those Republican victories and denounce the results of the presidential vote, which, after all, was on the same ballot as all those other contests? Does any of this make sense? And how do they justify this disconnect? I have never heard anyone from that camp even try to address that flaw in their reasoning. I mean, do you have any thoughts about this? Have you? Uh, heard any? No, I, I don't think there is any reasonable defense, and I agree with you. They, you know, I've I've seen that question be posed uh, to stop the steal people, and they just, you know, they just kind of dodge it or they revert to some kind of magic, like. Um, you know, the voting machine was programmed so that it switched votes away from Trump, but not away from senatorial candidates. <laughs> um, but but it, it's, uh, you know, but, but no, it's, it's, um, I mean, it's, that's one more set of facts that underscores or, or just, or, you know, or just highlights how preposterous the claim is that Trump won the election. I mean, it's simply, it, it violates common sense. Uh, it violates your senses and common sense. And, and there are about 10 different indicators you could look at uh, to reach that conclusion. Okay, and that, that's gonna lead me to my last question, which I want you to answer as fully as you wish. And uh, once we're done with that response, we'll, we'll open it up for questions. Um, okay, finally. And I really think this is perhaps the most important question of all. I wonder if a democratic form of government is possible in a country in which a large swath of the population has turned away from democracy. Or to put it another way, if a substantial portion of the electorate refuses to live in a world of verifiable facts, how can we survive as a country? Are you as frightened and pessimistic as I am? Um, the, short, the short answer to that is yes, I am. Um, and I am, um, you know, I, 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 as you know, I, I taught a course this term. I, after what happened on January 6th, I got very concerned, <laughs> a, little, a little agitated. Yeah. Um, and I junked what I was planning on teaching and taught a course called Understanding What Happened on January 6th. And, and then, you know, and then uh, everything since then, it was uh, working collectively with my students. Um, the more we learned and the more that has happened actually since then, um, the more alarmed I've, I've become. And I was, pre I was pretty alarmed last, you know, September. Um, I was very concerned about the possibility of Trump stealing the election. You know, I, I, after writing this whole book on the Electoral College, I knew where all the weak procedural points were in the Electoral College process. And his people just didn't plan far enough in advance on it. They are doing so now. They are planning now uh, to have the power to take, to, to use those weak procedural points in 2024. Um, but I also, I, har I confess that I harbored the notion, the hope probably, after the January 6th events, that those events would serve to discredit that wing of the Republican Party or discredit it to some degree, discredit Trump. Um, and a lot of people would back away from it, you know, as, as Nikki Haley did for about 15 minutes, um, as she, you know, she said, you know, he, he just doesn't deserve to be on the ballot. Um, and as McConnell did for, you know, about a half hour. Um, and so I, I thought that, that that would have positive consequences. It's clear now that that's not true. And it's clear that um, one of our major political parties and scores of millions of American citizens do not really care about, they care about they have wielding power and they do not care about democracy um, or preserving democratic institutions. And I, um, I find that very, I find that very, very scary. I mean, if 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 the polls had changed significantly, you know, after January or after Trump left office, uh, 
uh, I would have had a more auspicious view. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned. And I'm very concerned about some of the more subterranean things that are going on um, in these bills in the states. You know, for example, the Georgia bill, uh, which stripped power from the Secretary of State. Well, that wasn't designed just to, you know, get back at Brad Raffensperger. Uh, it was also designed to give a, pardon, a, a partisan legislature more power in counting votes if it ever decided that, it, you know, that it needed it. Um, so, you know, uh, whether a country as large and diverse and as economically unequal as ours um, can produce, uh, can sustain a democracy or can return to being a democracy is, I think, an open question. And um, I, I share the, you know, I, I share your somber conclusion as well as um, the clarion call to everybody to get out there and try to figure out what we can do, what each of us can do in our own, in our own way to, to fight this and to try to preserve democratic institutions. It's, it's, it's crisis time, right? This is, this, the, you know, we're at the moment. Well, I'm, I, I agree with you completely. Um, I've never been in my long life now as frightened about the, future of America as I am right now. Uh, our present prospects look bleak. Even, even, you know, getting back to the Republican Party for a second, the spectacle of the firing squad now out to um, um, uh, execute Liz Cheney in, in full view of, of, the, of the entire country is really something um, incredible. All she's doing is telling the truth and there is no room for truth tellers in that party anymore. And as I said earlier, when we have a party that is unmoored from any kind of reality, um, we're in deep trouble. Yeah, and, yeah. absolutely, just absolutely. And, and her and her conservative credentials are not exactly weak, or those of a. No, she's about the most right wing person in the country. But on this point, she knows you know right from wrong. She knows what what facts are and what non facts are. So. She's, she's being punished for it and probably will be defeated uh, for re-election uh, in, in 2022. All right, I have nothing more to say. Perhaps you have nothing more to say and, and we should open it up, Mitch, to, to questions. Well, <clears throat> other than just being um, equally frightened <laughs> by, by this yeah. discussion, I have to thank you both for, um, for really explaining a lot of what's going on right now. One of the questions that, that, um, that I have from here, first of all, I wanna tell everybody in the, that you can go to ask a question, can make a comment or ask a question and, and, and we'll pull it up in a minute. But Alex, you know, other than the, um, what they were doing to the Secretary of State in Georgia, what are some of the other egregious um, um, parts of the various laws that are being passed other than giving you know the the secretary of St uh, giving the legislature um overriding power over the secretary of state what are you seeing in these laws well you know one of the other things we're seeing in the um in the laws is um a, a new mechanism to permit governors to appoint i think this is in the florida law um to, to if, if any election commissioners who are usually elected um, or county commissioners are elected uh, um, need to be replaced, that the governor himself or herself will replace them and there will not be substitute <laughs> elections. Um, you know, that um, I see there are efforts in Michigan, um, I think it is, to, uh, to do away with the... Uh, or un undermine these uh, the boards, the auditing boards, and and you know certifications. The I forget the name of the mechanism, but the one that led that that young man whom we all became acquainted with for an hour, named I think his name was Aaron von Vertervelde, um, who was a Republican who 
refused to block cert certification of the Michigan election results, which right. after all were by 200,000 votes. Um, well, those boards are being weakened or disappearing. Hmm. So, you know, it is, it's all, you know, it's the kind of stuff that no one in their right mind under normal circumstances would want to pay attention to. I mean, you know, the, uh, but, you know, it's all behind the scenes stuff, but it's, it's, uh, I see this in a lot of different places in the legislation. In addition to the, you know, zippier things like, you know, we'll fine you if you bring water to someone waiting in line. So the second question I have is, so, you know, we know the groups that are fo uh, fighting voter suppression right now. So just if you could, if you know, if we can out some of those groups that are creating these laws, because, you know, these laws have happened so quickly that there have to be think tanks that have been coming up with these things, right, in order to, you know, uh, lay them onto the states. Do we know who those groups are? No, the, the big group is a group called ALEC, the American Legislative uh, something uh, AL, ALEC. Um, they've been they've been they've been doing these for years um, and spreading them. I mean, the uh, you know with the voter ID requirements. I also, but I also want to add. Uh, let me add something. Let me go sideways a little bit from your question too, which is that um, you know this reaction that we're seeing so vividly right now, I mean, these events so vividly, um, have plenty of recent precursors. And, you know, the three of us are old enough to sort of remember if we want to, uh, but, you know, I, do, I study this for a living. But um, when George Bush, the, the son, the younger, you know, after, after, in the, after the 2000 election, and particularly around the 2004 election, um, you know, when he was president, um, he, Carl Rove and the Attorney General began complaining that his that the U.S. attorneys in various states were not finding enough instances of election fraud. Mm -hmm. They wanted more instances of election fraud to justify, uh, you know, tighter laws. They actually fired or forced the resignations of five U.S. attorneys. Um, who, uh, you know, for the reason that, because some of these U.S. attorneys said we investigated, you know, when we found, we found, you know, two cases of election fraud involving an illiterate grandmother who didn't have any evil intent. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to prosecute her. Um, these people lost their jobs. So there was this wave of this, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and now they've got, you know, a lot of these people wield more power and, and can do more harm with it. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, Alec is very involved in this, and the Republican Party itself has now also been circulating, um, you know, model pieces of legislation. I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they have their think tanks. And, but the big one is Alex, Alec, A-L-E-C. Thanks. So we have a question here from uh, Samuel who says, who asks, could a state's electoral votes be allocated in fractions? For example, if a candidate won a state with six electoral votes by 55%, could that candidate be allocated 3.3 votes? He even did the math for us. So <laughs> I know Alex, in his book, talks about this at, at length. This, this kind of, uh, so but you should... Answer the question. Well, well, he also, yeah, he quotes George Orwell too, saying, "Sooner or later, a false belief bumps up against solid reality, usually on a battlefield," right. which is something. Uh, <coughs> Orwell was a smart man. Um, the the answer is that it can be done probably only, yes it can be done but probably only through a constitutional amendment. I mean, I I, I you know I I. I'm I'm supportive of the idea of states uh, using a proportional system to deal with their you know to distribute electoral votes. It's, it may seem less scary to some states than a national popular vote, and you can get pretty close to this to the same results. Um, the re the reason why you I think you can't just do it by legislation, although the lawyers could figure this out, uh, is that uh, you. You have to, there is a, the Constitution has a procedure for choosing electors. I don't know how exactly you go about choosing electors to the third decimal point. 
um you know there's so and the, under the current arrangement these people have to assemble someplace but you know could some clever person figure out a way to circumvent that maybe another question this is from uh another founder of wda carolyn forche asks if trump republicans take control of the house is it possible that they will certify trump as winner of the next presidential election on the next January 6th, no matter who the victor is. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Carolyn, that's some question. <laughs> well, as, as, and we might as well let our our general anxiety translate itself <laughs> into <concrete laughs> anxiety. Um, it's, I think that, well, it would have to be the House and the Senate because it takes, uh, uh, that the procedure that happens um, in Congress, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I you know, I I think that we saw on January sixth and in the days around it, um, we saw the ambiguities in the law and in the constitutional situation about what the role is of Congress in accepting or not accepting a state's electoral votes. And there is ambiguity in the law. Uh, there's there's some proce a little bit of procedural clarity, um, but there is ambiguity in the law, and that could be taken care of in precisely the the, the, the way that was discussed. Um, the uh, this other big um, you know looming hole in the uh, in the constitutional procedures for profession for presidential elections. Uh, is that the Constitution says that electors shall be chosen in such manner as the legislatures of each state shall decide, right? Um, suppose Florida will look like it was going to be pretty close. The Florida legislature, as presently constituted, could decide uh, that it that the legislature by itself was going to choose electors. Hmm. That would be perfectly constitutional. Um, and in fact, the Florida legislature debated doing that in late November of 2000, um, when it looked like the court cases in, in that election might go the other way. Um, and the, it seems to me that the Republican Party, or what, what, I, what we used to think of as a wing of the Republican Party, but now it's, a, now it's the Republican Party, um, has after this messing around in 2020, in which they explored these things in a kind of haphazard way, I think there are and will be preparations to systematically exploit these weak points um, for 2024. Wow. Here's a question. Uh, given everything you've both just said, can the United States even remain united? I feel as if we've become so ideologically balkanized, it's difficult to imagine getting to a sense of unification again. And I guess that also begs the question, other than the Civil War, can you think of another time when we've been in this kind of circumstance historically in this country? Paul, well, do you want to take a shot? Yeah, well, uh, I've often said to myself, no, not since the Civil War have we been so divided. Uh, and I've often thought about, um, you know, breaking up the country. It seems as if it could be a plausible idea. But exactly how would you go about it? This is the problem. I mean, what, give the Confederacy back its own uh, 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 country, make, make, make that a country again? Well, think of all the, you know, the people in Georgia, the, the uh, Democratic uh, Georgians who, who wouldn't want to live in, in that country. What do we do? Do we have uh, mass exoduses of pop major populations mm -hmm. crisscrossing the country until they find their, their home? which in another generation could shift into some other mutation of political balance, I have no idea. All I know is that um, I've often thought, at least, damn it, New York City should be its own state. <laughs> <laughs> and we should get rid of Staten Island and just have the four boroughs, and then, then we, could, we could just say goodbye to the United States altogether. Um, after 9-11, there was a a poetry magazine I got in the mail from uh, a friend, and um, it, it simply said, US, USA out of NYC. <laughs> and I thought, this is such a great thing. I, I cut it out and I framed it, and I have it in my, in my room upstairs. Um, because at times, 
you know, this country is so, so depressing and so frustrating and, um, and all the goodwill we pour into it, all the, 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 the hopes that we have for it and all the really wonderful things about America too. Um, but it all comes to garbage, you know, when these people of bad will want to impose their bad will on the others. And um, we've been fighting this now for, for a long time. And um, it makes one weary to think how easily we could, we could solve so many of the problems that are, are facing us. And um, for one reason or another, we continue to fail to do that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. If you can figure out, whoever asked the question, how to divide people up into the proper countries, um, I, in a few years, I might, I might be willing to go along with you. Well, I think it was Charles Blow or someone that has a new book out in which they're calling for a great migration of, you know, progressives and Democrats into those states uh, that aren't in order to sort of capture the vote in some of those states. Um, I don't know how easy that would be either. To be no, honest. no, I didn't but, strike me as a great idea either. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I do think to, to try to end on a, 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 a sort of a hopeful way is I think that um, it's one of the reasons why WDA formed and why there are so many groups that are very active looking at the 2022 elections. And um, hopefully we can change conventional wisdom and not lose as many seats as people are supposed to lose on an off-year election. And maybe that could be reversed and maybe you know, maybe there's a way in which uh, electorally we can buck the trend and try to get more people, you know, into those positions and get a little bit more of a majority to make things change. But you're absolutely right. It is uh, a very difficult thing. But what I want to encourage people to do are two things. One, make sure you buy these authors' books, particularly if you're interested in this subject, Alex's books are available you just click on the on the bar there and you'll see alex's books and then you can put paul's books paul's name in there and we have all of his online as well and the other thing is you can go to writersfordemocraticaction.org and you can become a become a sign up and become a um an advocate along with everyone else that that belongs to that organization and I was just told that there's one more question that we should get to. Here it is. It's, uh, it's, I do share the concern you've both put forward, given that even though I don't live in the U.S., I was born and raised in Argentina. And sadly enough, and much to my dismay, people are also turning away from democracy. There's a nonsensical pull and push strategy between political parties. There's a huge political rift, which is not contributing uh, at all. And we ordinary citizens are just on the edge of the abyss, suffering from their shenanigans. And I think this is from, um, and it ends with, love you, Paul. And I believe it comes from Alex's wife. <laughs> oh. oh <laughs> that's, that's Cecilia, oh. right, Alex? Is that right? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, she, my, my wife is Brazilian, so I don't know why she would have uh, invoked Argentina, which is a rivalry. Oh, okay. No, no. For some reason, I got confused. Anyway, this is someone who loves Cecilia uh, Ranuncolo, if you know her or not. Okay. But um, anyway, sorry to have flubbed that one. But <laughs> Well, I mean, let me just offer one, you know, one or two comments about that. I think that, I, you know, I think that we're we are talking about a about global threats right now to democracy exacerbated by the pandemic but um but uh you know and they are widespread and it's not it's not altogether clear to me you know how severe they're going to prove to be at every place i mean i think that some places what we're seeing is a sort of are mild threats other places it's much more severe but the argentina example is, is, is i think it's very important 
as a kind of counterexample in our minds. I mean, Argentina has struggled to maintain democratic institutions for a century. Um, it has had a series of coups. And in the minds of folks, you know, like us who grew up in, you know, in North America, it's like, well, that was all those other countries in Latin America and other parts of the world. They, they have their instabilities, their generals take over from time to time. But we here have our rock solid, pre-soaped, um, non-soapy um, institutions so that however dicey things get, um, we're going to stay with those institutions. Um, and, you know, I think that in a way, the moment that's or what strikes me as most compelling about this moment is now I think a growing number of us are no longer, do not see the United States as this exceptional bedrock. We are, you know, uh, we can collapse the same way other countries have. Yeah. I, I wanted to say one more thing, um, just, just to also talk about something that is very much happening all around us. Uh, how, how pleased I have been by the early days of the Biden administration. Um, I, I've been impressed by his discipline and focus and his understanding of the large stakes involved in, in what's in front of us. And I believe he's, he's, he's proposed some very strong and effective pieces of legislation that would make a very big difference in how we live our lives. And my feeling is that if we can get the Democrats together and somehow do away with the filibuster and get these laws passed, they're going to make a big difference in American life. And I think if people can wake up in the morning without feeling pressured about paying the rent as they've been, if we have better wages, uh, not sweating every medical bill that comes in, not having to decide between, you know, drugs and food, you know, in order how, because they don't have enough. If some of that internal pressure can be relieved by reformulating how we live as a country, I believe some of the anger and tension and hatred in the country is going to subside almost miraculously because in silence people are not going to even be aware of why they're a little less angry today than they were six months before and that's why i believe it's very important for the democrats to pass some of this legislation they'll not be able to get it all through but one or two of these major bills if they can get through i think they will have a great chance of of holding ground in the 2022 election if none of them get passed, if it's all a big washout, then I think um, they're going to be in a very weak position when 2022 comes and 2024 as well. And so I think that they should tell Joe Manchin, you know, that if we don't pass this stuff, you know, we're all going to be wiped out and that you better get with the program very quickly or else you're going to be extinct as, long, as well as everybody else. We'll see. That's my only hope right now is to pass this legislation. Well, I think that what we're going to see, if Joe Manchin does do that, we're going to see the greatest bridges ever built in <laughs> West Virginia yes. that you could possibly ever imagine. That is my, that's what I'm hoping. Is Let him hoping. have his bridges. Let I'm him sorry. have his bridges. Right, right. And, the, and, 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 the, and the, you know, we'll, we'll even let him keep the coal industry for a while. <laughs> but, but, I, right. but anyway, I want to thank you both. It's been really amazing. And this talk about, you know, to this, this thing that Cecilia was talking about in terms of Argentina. So, you know, WDA will also be doing programs in which we talk about democracy around the world. So if you want to find out what goes on, go to writersfordemocraticaction.org and you can sign up and you'll get all the emails and everything that's happening. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Alex. Glad to bring you together so you have a little bit of reunion. Yeah. And uh, sorry, we all can't go out for a beer afterwards, but that'll happen soon enough, I bet. Well, thank you, Mitch. Thank and you, Mitch. You were wonderful. Great to have you both. Thank you.